um, and also the, the emotional and the psychological. So a second thing to think about when we think when we're looking at violence is that violence is a pathway um, and it's about a, a, for a person to become violent, to perpetrate violence against others. It's usually not something that happens out of the spur of a the moment. There's usually a series of events that have influenced that particular moment in time when someone becomes violent, whether it's physically, sexually, emotionally towards another person or other people. Um, and the important thing is here, it's, it's about pathways and it's how certain factors interact with one another that results in the outcome. So this is where violence scholars have borrowed from the public health thinking around disease, particularly infectious disease, and brought that into understandings of violence. And so the, the work that's been done, and this has really re reinforced this notion of, sorry, my computer keeps jumping forward, this notion of violence as a pathway and different risk and protective factors inter interacting with each other. So the sense of around, if there are lots of risk factors and you know, the person has faced that make them predisposed towards violence, then there's a very high chance that we be violence. But if there's other protective factors that are counteracting these risk factors, then the chances of that person being violent are reduced. So here is just sort of one of the models that to give you some idea about what I'm talking about, risk and protective factors. So this is borrowing, it's called the socio-ecological model on violence perpetration, violence victimization. And what it says is that in order to understand violence and why people perpetrate violence, we need to understand that there are different levels and different risk factors that influence this. So there's, if you take a person who's perpetrated violence, there would have been individual factors that influenced them, probably relation factors, community factors, and societal factors. And you can see on the screen here, some are some examples of those particular risk factors. So for example, at the individual level, often it's about uh, a history of child maltreatment, child abuse, trauma, um, often it's about some psychological issues, some psychological disorder person may be influenced by, they may be um, abusing alcohol, they may have a history of violent behavior. Then of course, there are other risk factors at the relationship level, and this is typically within the household, typically within the family, uh, where they've kind of experienced as children poor parenting practices, there's um, kind of uh, dysfunctional dynamics within a household, um, and then a, a range of other issues. At the community level, it's about usually we see risk factors are individuals living in high crime neighborhoods, uh, usually where there's high levels of unemployment, there is, um, you know, a number of other perpetrators of violence crime happening. And at the societal level, we often tend to see a range of factors taking place. It's typically about poor levels of the respect for the rule of law. We often see um, sort of cultural norms, societal norms where violence is condoned and accepted as a means of resolving conflicts. So these kind of risk factors do vary bet between violence types. So this is just some examples about them, just to give you an idea of how one can try and understand violence. So these are just the risk factors and the protective factors would be the kind of the counter of this. So for example, um, someone who's brought, brought, been brought up in a loving home with, with kind of parents who've been really supportive, um, and that kind of counteracts some of the other risk factors, for example. So really, when you think about this, think about the risk factors, but if they're also protective factors in play, that tends to counteract. Then moving on to the data around crime and violence within South Africa. So relative to other African countries, South Africa has fairly good data on violence. Uh, but the main data source we have is the South African Police Service data, and they bring out crime data. It's been traditionally every year, and it goes back to the early 1900s. Um, of course, pre-mid-1990s, the data wasn't particularly good because it predominantly focused on, on white areas. Uh, but certainly from the late 1990s onwards, the data's got better. And in recent years, uh, the South African Police Service data has been endorsed um, and has now become official uh, South African statistics because it's been endorsed by Stat South Africa, where prior up to about four or five years ago, it wasn't official statistics because they didn't follow the same quality controls that Stats South Africa required for it to become official crime data. But we do have, for example, victims of crime data that Stats SA brings out, but they don't do it consistently enough if we want to understand trends. We have hospital data um, that's collected, mortuary data that's collected, but it's not that accessible to the public. So the best data we have is the South African Police Services data. Um, and it's useful because it's national data, it's provincial data, and it's station level data. Um, we don't have the SAPs don't produce data at the city level, which uh, makes, if you're going to have a discussion about crime in a particular city, 
interesting and difficult, but it's not impossible. So what we've done and others have done is to use the SAPS data and able to calculate city level data. So that's what we've produced for the South African Cities Network up to a year or two ago and the South Institute for Security Studies took over more recently um, and produced that sort of data as well. Um, an important issue around data is if we're looking at trends within particularly like policing precincts or policing areas, <coughs> One of the challenges is that policing boundaries don't correspond to census areas. So census uh, data gives us all sorts of information about people who live in a particular area, um, age, employment, gender, household income, all sorts of really useful data. But the problem is the sort of enumerator census areas don't correspond to the policing areas. So it makes it very difficult to look at other factors around crime. We get crime data, but it's very difficult to draw on other information at smaller areas. Um, and just sort of finally on these, um, I don't want to get too involved in the data issue, is there are some credibility issues in some areas. Um, the problem a number of years ago, the police decided to include reductions in crime as a key performance indicator for police stations. Um, and of course, what this has done in certain places is it affected the reliability of the crime data because there's been an incentive to discourage the reporting of crime because if your, your station has been set a particular target to bring down attempted murder by 10%, um, and people are coming to report attempted murder at your police station, you've already met your your target, your quota, then you discourage that from happening. We've seen it happening in many places on, on categories, particularly on robbery and theft as well. Um, but the reporting issues is an issue. So in the wealthier, more stable areas, crime reporting is usually pretty good. People will go and report crimes. But in higher crime areas where trust in the police is quite low, the reporting levels aren't as good. So it's usually about 80% in some places, but in in poorer, more crime prone areas, sometimes it's around 40 to 50%. And it does vary between reporting categories. So for example, on murder usually is pretty good um, across all areas because there's a body, um, people need a death certificate, there's often life insurance associated with it. So if we are gonna look at crime trends in cities, crime trends in South Africa, murder is usually the best way to go um, and this has been certainly endorsed by the un uh, office for drugs and crime that looks at these kind of issues and they have a global homicide project and the kind of understanding is that murder is a fairly good proxy for looking at other forms of violent crime so let me move away from you know, all these particular background issues and into the, the sort of subject matter of the lecture so really as a starting point as i said i i, I wanted to have a look mainly at murder because it it is the most reliable data with it's where we're seeing the major crisis within south africa but just to give you some background information about it using the sort of risk matrix model that i showed you um, what we know about murder is that the majority of both victims and perpetrators are men and they're between the ages of about 15 and 40. Um, often people who, who are unaware of the data because of a lot of uh, media about it think that women are the, the main victims of, of murder where they aren't globally, it's majority men. Women, of course, um, account for a lot more of emotional abuse, a lot more in terms of domestic violence, but certainly from a murder point of view, it's men. It's men perpetrating violence against men, predominantly young men. Yeah. A key issue is that often the distinction between perpetrator and victim of murder is blurred, is that typically it's two individuals that have got into some sort of disagreement, both engage in a violent act, and the one who dies is either unlucky or the one who is not that well armed or doesn't have the arm that the other has. Uh, we know within South Africa, firearms are the most common instrument used in murder. It's about a third of all murders are committed with firearms, uh, followed by sharp instruments such as knives and then blunt instruments such as bricks and sticks. Um, we know that most murders take place over weekends and after dark. I mean, this is a trend we've seen for a very long period over time. And we know in terms of risk factors that most murders are associated with alcohol consumption that are combined with some form of interpersonal conflict. Um, and the sort of what I've got down written down here is pro-violence norms and beliefs. And this is about notions that you can resolve problems by using violence. Um, and this is often linked to kind of masculinity, where if you get into a disagreement with someone, it's about showing that you're a man and a man fights and solves his problems by using violence to solve those problems. Um, and so typically these murders are also concentrated in specific areas. Um, and I'll get to in more detail about that a bit later in the lecture. Also in Cape Town, we know that gang conflicts are a key risk factor for murder. And we've seen this repeated by, certainly by, 
Um, the city authorities, JP Smith's made this point on a number of occasions. We've seen at the provincial level that uh, various officials, including the mayor, have made, and the mayor certainly in Cape Town, Dan Plato, previously he was um, MEC for community safety, but the current MEC, uh, Albert Fritz for community safety in the Western Cape has also kind of re-emphasized that a lot has to do with gang conflicts. And I'll get into more detail about that. Really, just to kind of cover gang violence in Cape Town, and I think some of this is probably is is fairly self-evident to those who sort of watch issues of crime and violence within Cape Town. But to take you through the risk profile is what do we know about gangs? I mean, what do we know about the risk factor for gang violence? And certainly at the individual level, we know it's individuals who are typically are quite impulsive. They they usually dropped out of school, so they haven't had this attachment to school. So they've got this all poor academic performance. Some more interesting work that's come out of the, the medical sciences about violent individuals and those associated with gangs is that many tend to have a low resting heart rate and engage in risk-taking behavior to increase their arousal, to, to, you know, to, to kind of increase the sense of feeling alive. And often this are attracted to gangs because of that. And there's some interesting work around uh, women who are pregnant and who live in high crime, highly stressful environments, and that what that stress does to the embryo and what it does in terms of uh, contributing to individuals who are born with this low resting heart rate, but also individuals who are prone to in engaging in fights because of the, the response to the stress that they were exposed to in the woman's, in their mother's womb. So this is some interesting stuff that's happening there, but let me, go ahead and let me not get carried away with that. There are many other dynamics here, such as family factors. We've seen gangsters coming from particularly homes with a lot of fighting, dysfunctionality, where they've been exposed to harsh discipline, where they've kind of had you know, a lot of corporal punishments and beatings happening. Um, often large families where there isn't much supervision going on. We see typically individuals like this getting involved in sort of low-level criminality and delinquency, um, living in neighborhoods where there's sort of social and cultural norms, where sort of gangsterism isn't necessarily seen as, as being a, a, a huge problem, as seen as people disliking gangsters, but it's seen as acceptable and, and you, know, you know, kind of seen as part of the neighborhood. Um, often gang gangsters, aspiring gangsters are coming from poorer areas, high crime areas, and often they kind of are engaging in gangs because they've been exposed to, because they're angry, they have been humiliated, or they kind of feel a sense of, um, you know, insecurity that other people are going to, other youngsters are going to target them with violence, hence join a gang for protection, often join gangs for revenge, that you've encountered violence, you have been a victim of violence, you join a gang so that you can get revenge. Um, we also know within the Cape Town context is that prisons are often the universities of crime here is that you will, an individual may have committed a minor crime, gets sent to prison and joins a gang in prison. And when leaves prison, they are already in the gang network. And then finally, gang violence is particularly happens when there are gang rivalries. And this is a key issue within Cape Town that we've seen in recent years is that rivalries between gangs have resulted in in violence spilling over in many areas and resulting in major escalations and violence too. So let me get into the trends of what we've been seeing in Cape Town and you just bear with me. Some of the graphs are, there's quite a bit of detail in them. So I'm just going to talk you through and identify the key aspects of them um, and, and then get to a bit of an explanation about them. But to start off with, just to give you a, a longer term idea of, of violent crime within South Africa, and here I'm using the murder rate. So this is the rate of murders per 100,000 population, which is a really good indicator around how you can use to compare violent crime over time. And as you can see in the mid-1990s, you know, murder was really elevated. It was close to 70 per 100,000. And then it drops down significantly to about 2000 to 2010, 2011. Then it starts to increase gradually, and it has been increasing over the past decade. Um, the reduction in murder to sort of almost a 50% reduction in murder since the 1990s to 2010 is largely due to work around firearms. And it had to do with major policing operations to seize large quantities of illegal firearms in high crime areas, but also improvements in firearms control. That's partially the explanation for that. We're not entirely, we don't have a comprehensive understanding of why that happened also because of certain conflicts in KwaZulu-Natal being resolved that might have contributed to this. But that's just really to give you an indication of the sort of national picture around violence. But certainly the picture in Cape Town is very different to this. So I'm going to show you a few graphs now, which 
were derived for the South African Cities Network, and it was looking at eight major cities within South Africa um, and crime rates within those particular cities. So a lot of work was done to take the police data and calculate it at a city level. So this is the first one. This is murder rate. So you've got different colors in front of you now. The key at the bottom are, are abbreviated terms for the city. So we've got JHB is Johannesburg, CPT is Cape Town, ETH is Etiquini, EKU is Ekuruleni, TSH is Twane, NMB is Nelson Mandela Bay, MAN is Manaung. BCM is Buffalo City Municipality, or formerly East London, and MSU is in Zunduzi or Peter Maritzburg. Um, and they've got different colors here. So the color I really want to bring your attention to is the orange line. So this is the city of Cape Town. And as you can see, it's the, the highest line. And you sort of notice the trends in the other cities. So the other cities are following the sort of national trends. So you sort of see reductions to 2010, 2011, and then slight increases afterwards. Um, a comparison here is if you're looking at the small dotted line is the is the national um, uh, murder rate, and then you've got the long uh, dashed line above that, which is the metro average. So you can see certainly if the orange line, the city of Cape Town, is significantly higher than anywhere else. Um, a similar trend is if you look at the the kind of dark green line, which is just below the orange line, and that is Nelson Mandela Bay. But uh, particularly Cape Town, you can see the significant upward trajectory of the murder rate that's happened compared to other cities. So something is going on in Cape Town compared to other cities. And I will get into my understandings of why this has happened. But I just want to take you through a few more graphs uh, um, to kind of try and explain this. So an important thing about Cape Town and around violence in Cape Town is it's not evenly distributed. And I'm sure you're all aware of that. It is concentrated in a small number of high crime areas. So if we look at the police data in the Western Cape, 43% of all murders in terms of the current uh, crime statistics um, take, took place in just 10 policing areas or precincts. And all of them are in Cape Town. And I've listed them here um, uh, in terms of more recent data, uh, Samora Michelle, is one of the more, um, is, is, is also included in that particular lift. I, I think Ravensmead's dropped out, but this is just to give you an indication of where the red line in this particular graph is the is the rate for the entire city of Cape Town. But as you can see these particular areas, it's significantly higher. So these are murder rates, it's not total murders. Then to look at some other crimes, here is um, attempted murder rates. Um, also, city of Cape Town is an orange. As you can see, the sort of, sorry, slight change in the, in the color coding here. Nelson Mandela Bay is the sort of dark red. Here you can see significantly higher than others. The city of Cape Town's trend is following the murder trend. Then if we're looking at other types of violent crime here, um, the city of Cape Town is orange too. Um, you can see it's below a number of other cities, particularly city of Johannesburg and Nelson Mandela Bay. The interesting here is you can see a significant increase, certainly from 2010, 2011. And so this is probably the crime that most South Africans fear. Um, it often involves the use of a weapon, typically a firearm or a knife where individuals break into your home. So this is one who expects Johannesburg is renowned for having higher levels of, of, of armed robberies in the home, but certainly Cape Town we've seen increases over the past 10 years. Then also carjacking as well, where you know Cape Town has traditionally had comparatively low rates, but also significant increases in, in certainly over the past decade on this particular issue. And then this is a slightly confusing graph, but it's really the point I want to just bring to your attention is significant differences in terms of trends that are happening. So you can see, if you look at the dark green line, aggravated robbery, which is violent robbery, um, certainly in Cape Town has increased, where other categories of crime, you know, we can see it shows you murder here, but if you look at other categories of crime, such as sexual offenses and property related crime, you've seen reductions. But this is this particular trend is is uh, is problematic with the data on this reporting levels, particularly around sexual crime, sexual violence, and property related crimes is typically very low in in high crime areas. So I wouldn't trust that trend. But I think the important point from this one is to look at aggravated robbery, and it's also showing an increase. So, in trying to kind of come to terms with this, why have we seen this dramatic uh, dramatic trend within Cape Town, why this dramatic increase in violent crime in Cape Town, particularly around murder, attempted murder, or other forms of violent crime. Has it got to do with alcohol? Um, certainly there's a big conversation about alcohol and its relationship to trauma and violence 
given the lockdown, given the, the banning of sale of alcohol, um, also what happened with the releasing of the, the sort of quarterly crime stats over the past nine months, as we've seen that under hard lockdown, so level four, level five, that murder rates, other forms of, of violent crime came down um, across the board. So the kind of question, has it something to do with alcohol? Did suddenly more alcohol flood within to the city of Cape Town that contributed to violence? Has it got to do with a change in attitude or behavior? Have people become more violent? Are they more attuned to, um, you know, using violence as a way to resolve problems? Has it got to do with gang conflicts, gangs fighting individuals and gangs? Or does it have to do with firearms? And so my sort of reflection on this, and I've been thinking about it for a number of years and coming at the issue of violence from different perspectives, is the centrality of firearms. And it's it's an issue that has because I've worked in in many conflict zones and trying to understand what drives conflicts, what leads to the reemergence of conflicts when a peace agreement has been signed. And arms are a key issue, and because arms aren't necessarily neutral items, sometimes they're dealt with as that. But what we've seen in a key issue within the city of Cape Town was in around 2007, 2008, we had an individual who was in the South African Police Service responsible for the destruction of all the weapons in Gauteng and other areas in neighboring provinces um, that had been confiscated by the police, that had been surrendered to the police, that the police themselves wanted to get rid of. And his job was to facilitate the destruction of these weapons. And his name was uh, Colonel Christian Prinzler. Um, so here is a picture of him on this particular slide. And and what he did was he sold what, with the best of our knowledge, 2,400 firearms directly to gangs in the city of Cape Town, to specific gangs. And what, it, what was existing in around 2000, 2007, 2008 was there was gang violence, but it had reached a sort of a, a, a level of certain stability is that gangs had sort of carved out areas of control. They had used they used violence to mediate conflicts between them, but their sort of this sort of mutual stalemate had been reached. But what happens is when you introduce that many weapons to specific gangs, it changes the dynamics and it emboldened a number of gangs with the view to taking over territory of other gangs. And this really sort of sparked and sent a wave of violence throughout the Cape Flats. And it leads to other gangs trying to source firearms to fight other gangs. And what it did was you had certain gangs that started a process of engaging with corrupt elements within the South African Police Service, particularly in the Central Firearm Registry or the CFR. And there is a current case going on at the moment. It's linked to the murder of, of Charles Kinnear, who a number of you would have you know, seen coverage about his murder in the media, you know, went on for weeks, um, around certain gangsters and criminal key crime lords within Cape Town using corrupt individuals within the police to secure firearm licenses for their firearms. Um, so this this issue has really kind of transformed things. So it means that a lot more individuals have guns. Gangs are fighting with one another, led to more murders of gangsters. You've seen reprisals because of those murders. You see other gangs trying to get firearms. They're using firearms. More gangsters have firearms. Those firearms are being used to perpetrate other crimes, such as um, home, home robberies, such as carjackings. Um, and so the sense of around the guns came in and they have really sort of supercharged the violent dynamics, the risk factors for violence within the city of Cape Town. Then let me finally, since um, kind of I said I wouldn't speak for longer than, for, than 40 minutes, get into this issue of gender-based violence, given it's such a high priority issue, given that South Africa has such high levels of gender-based violence within South Africa. So the term I want to use is men's violence against women, because I find gender-based gender, gender -based violence this is a bit of an abstract term because gender relates to men, women, uh, girls, boys, um, and I don't think it's a particularly helpful kind of means to analyze a particular issue. And certainly what we've seen within South Africa is a pandemic of men's violence against women. And I really want to just give you sort of a summary of the work that's been done, particularly that we did within the Safety and Violence Initiative for national cabinets on helping them understand why does this violence happen? And in understanding that and looking at the pathways of this particular violence, how can you interrupt it? How can you bring in interventions to try and prevent this from happening? So let me jump into that quickly. 
Now, I, you don't have to understand these particular diagrams. What these are, these are predictive models. So it's, it's a, a technique, a statistical technique has been used called structural equation modeling. And these are potentially are actually really powerful because what we did with this is we had really good data sets um, that are longitudinal data sets. So we followed, we had data from a population of more than 2,000 individuals in the city of Cape Town who were representative. Um, and the, a series of questionnaires were administered to them over about a 10 year period. So you can get really good data and you can see what experiences people have over time and how that impacts on their lives. So it's similar to you might have watched those seven up document documentaries where they go and visit people and uh, shoot a documentary when they're seven years old, 14 years old, 21 years old, and sort of see how their lives have changed. And this is how longitudinal studies work. So we fortunately had access to this data and we can do some modeling about it. And we were interested around why do men perpetrate violence against women? And here are two models that look at intimate partner violence. So individuals who are in relationships with one another, they're either married or their girlfriend or boyfriend or in a common law relationship. Um, and so we were interested and in, looked at physical violence, so hitting and beating and sexual violence, particularly rape. And so we were interested in the pathways and the different risk and protective factors that happened here. So you can see here as violence is a complex issue, but a lot has to do with um, and kind of the issue that jumps out here is you can sort of see these particular pathways. It has to do with alcohol abuse. It has to do with post-traumatic stress disorder. It has to do with uh, male control of the relationship. It has to do with norms about gender. Do you think men are better than women? And the sort of issues that popped out for us out of this particular predictive modeling were that different forms of abuse that men had suffered was a major determinant of violence against women perpetration later on in life. And it meant that men who had suffered from this form of trauma and abuse were less likely to ascribe to gender equality. So they didn't see women as their equals. Um, it also tended to contribute to alcohol abuse and a sense of greater control in relationships. And this is sort of been reinforced in a number of other countries as well around there obviously are the many factors playing into this. But if we want to do something about violence, men's violence against women, we need to look at the other major pandemic within South Africa, which is violence against children and the very high levels of, of abuse that are happening in, in, in homes and particularly in, in relation to both boys and girls. And it's something that needs to be done. It's not only around boys. We need to be looking at girls because also the studies showed that girls who were subjected to maltreatment and abuse in the home were at very high risk of becoming victims of uh, gender-based violence or men's violence against them. So the kind of key issue that stood out for us, if we're wanting to do something as a, as a country, we need we really need to be looking at the issue of violence against children. So let me leave it at that. Um, I'm just under 40 minutes, so I'd like to certainly open up for any questions or comments, which I'd most welcome. I also would uh, welcome anyone who disagrees with me. I, I have an open mind on these issues. So uh, without any further ado, let me unshare my screen. Sorry, let me do that quickly. And I'm happy to open up for any questions or comments. And please, if you can just raise your hand. I'm not sure if uh, if anyone wants to, if anyone from the summer school wants to facilitate, but I'm also happy to facilitate as well. Right, I don't see anyone from the summer school jumping in, so please do raise your hands. Uh, if you have any comment or question, there are no silly questions. So Anthony Ginsburg, I see your hand is up. Over to you. You're still muted, Anthony, if you want to, Anthony, if you want to put your mic on, please. What about drugs as a driver of violence? Okay, great. If, uh, okay, so what I'll do is let me just take each question at a time. Absolutely. Um, we, we've we seen within Cape Town, obviously depends on the particular drugs. Um, the data we have around drugs is not is not that good in relation to violence, but we certainly know that tick is a major intervening risk factor for violence. So we have all these underlying risk factors, but you bring tick into the mix, it certainly makes individuals prone to violence. Uh, we've certainly seen that it tends to affect individuals' behavior, um, particularly in terms of 
uh, the nature of emotional intelligence and feeling um, empathy towards others. Um, so that's, you know, we know within within South Africa and looking at certainly trauma victims, the data that some of my colleagues have done within the Kuduskiu uh, Hospital and the trauma unit there, looking at trauma patients coming in, that they saw a third of trauma patients had some form of drugs in their system, most of which were tick. So absolutely tick is a key issue. Any other questions or comments? David Kirk, I see your hand up. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um, I, I clearly missed the story when it happened about the 2,400 guns that were being uh, directed to all, all the, the, the gangs at that point. I was wondering, are there any estimates or reliable otherwise of the number of guns in, the illegal guns in CT? Is that 2,500? Is that a, a doubling? Is, is there any way to get a sense of how big it is? Uh, David, it's, it's a tricky one. We, we don't really know. I mean, there is stats. I, I, I could pull them up for you if you want to do, but it's they're sort of estimates. So what we know is um, at some point, a figure of 500,000 was thrown around for the whole of South Africa. We don't know in the context of Cape Town. Um, I mean, I think the important thing what happened in Cape Town was is that the police were quite effective in seizing illegal firearms, particularly from 2000 to about 2007. So they had major operations, went into high crime areas, and it made the firearms less accessible to gangs particularly. So we saw a lot of reports of gangs using homemade weapons um, or a lot more knives were being used in the case of gang altercations. And these 2,400 kind of changed that particular dynamic. We don't know... I can't give you an, an exact figure on, I mean, I would I would just be guessing on the number of firearms. We just know that they're, they're a significant number and they're having a, a major effect. The one challenge at the moment is we don't know where the gangs are getting their ammunition from uh, because the guns, we know these guns went into the market, but, you know, this, this, the gangs are behaving in a way that it seems that ammunition is unlimited. Um, and I think the investigations that are underway that Shulk and Air were involved in I think was trying to expose that because I think there must be some complicity com, com, complicity by corrupt police in this particular issue or manufacturer, not massive manufacturers, but certainly uh, brokers who have access to, to ammunition suppliers who are then supplying gangs. But I'm afraid I can't give you an exact figure on illegal guns. Yeah, thanks. But I think your, your answer is also provided more nuance there that it's the the fact that the gangs were having to resort to other weapons before yeah. and perhaps now aren't, that, that does already provide an indication that, this, that that was a big contributor. Thank you. Yeah, no, the, 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 it has. And I mean, the worry for me is that, because um, what it did is, <laughs> is that, you know, because the police were actually fairly effective in reducing guns up until about 2008, is that it became more difficult to secure guns. Also, firearm owners became a lot more required by law, but also became a lot more safety conscious. So they were required to store their weapons and safes and these sort of things. So it was more difficult to steal firearms. Um, uh, and then what's happened is, you know, then criminals then look towards police and police stations. We've seen a number of cases where police stations have been robbed of firearms or individuals who take care of police armories have been bribed to get guns out of there. But my worry now is because of you know, gangs being armed, other gangs looking to armed is that, you know, private licensed firearm owners are and may increasingly be targeted for their firearms because it's seen as a much valued resource. And we certainly see this in, in robberies where the firearm is a key motivating factor for the robbery. Uh, any other questions, comments? I think you would, David. Your hands up again. Uh, yeah, I was waiting to check. I wasn't monopolizing, but since the answer the question for now, um, so I, I live in Cape Town, but I'm originally from PE. Th those graphs didn't show Nelson Mandela Bay in a particularly positive light either. Is there any kind of commonality there, or those different areas? Is that not an area that you, you're that close to? The my understanding of Nelson Mandela Bay PE is it's had a similar dynamic and. What and from what my understandings and having conversations with police and police reports are that guns, the big story was the guns flowed to Cape gangs, but there was also guns that flowed to gangs within Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, and it seems as though in other areas as well. So the kind of a lot of the focus around the, the, the 
uh, the Christian Prinzler trial, and he is actually out on bail at the moment, um, is or had to do with the guns to Cape Town. But there's, it, I think that was only part of this illegal transfer of guns. And I think a big chunk, big transfers went to Nelson Mandela Bay because that can only explain it. And the police's response um, to it was to set up particular high density operations focusing on gang areas, focusing on gangsters. And their report seemed to indicate it was that gangs, certain gangs had acquired guns and the same dynamic had happened as we've seen in Cape Town. And in Cape Town, it's in it's not the whole of Cape Town, obviously, in very specific areas, and it's the same within um, within the Nelson Mandela Bay as well. Happy to take other questions, comments. I'm looking. See nobody. No more questions. See Maya, and then Sutherland. Hey. Sorry, guy. Oh, you've got it up. Your two hands up. Maya and Sullivan. Okay, I'll go first. Um, it's it's quite what I found quite interesting is there is a perception that Johannesburg has more crime than Cape Town. That's sort of a general perception. So perhaps you just want to unpack maybe why that perception exists given the, the stats we've just seen today. Well, I mean, traditionally the focus has been on on Johannesburg, and as we could see, certain crime stats Johannesburg is higher. So certainly on um. Uh, uh, residential robberies, so home invasion robberies, certainly on carjacking. Um, and it sort of got this reputation because it was prior to 10 years ago, you know, an aggregate, on an aggregate level, it was the most violent city. Um, but uh, it, it, it has to do with Johannesburg has a gang problem, but not the same level of gang violence that Cape Town has, for example. And that's really what's been driving it. So criminals have access to firearms within Johannesburg. Um, they, but it's not the same violence dynamic where it's largely interpersonal kind of murder that's happening where an individual's killing another individual over a disagreement. It's often not that linked to gangs and it's really what's happened in Cape Town. It's because of the gang war. Um, and that's what's largely driven not only the murder and attempted murder rates up above Johannesburg, for example, but has also affected other forms of violent crime, such as carjacking. Um, but yeah, so it's Johannesburg used to on an aggregate level be like that, but because of the gang violence within Cape Town, it's changed the dynamic for, for Cape Town most certainly. Sutherland, Sullivan, you're next. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you, Guy. Um, just a quick comment on this Prince Lou idiot. Was he convicted or is he being convicted? So the trial was, I'm going to stand to be corrected, but it was 2012, 2013, around there. I think it was no, I mean, 2014, 2015. And he was convicted on weapons trafficking. He was supposed to have served a much larger sentence. And he was then released because of COVID-related um, concern. So obviously prisons are overcrowded within South Africa. So they've been, uh, Department of Correctional Services has been releasing individuals who they view as being well behaved and not posing a threat. So he was quietly released. But it also seems so with sort of the story is still unfolding here is that he seems to be linked to the Kinnear killing. So he's a witness, supposedly is going to be a state witness um, in relation to this particular case of the killing of Shaul Kinnear, where he can uh, provide information against those who have been arrested. So I think that's potentially a reason maybe why he's been put on parole, but he's in protective custody because he will be if he will be murdered if he isn't in protective custody. And that's what we've seen happening in a number of cases. Um, but yeah, the, the, the kind of key issue was he wasn't, he wasn't convicted on murder or attempted murder. Um, and there were a lot of conversations from the victims because what they did, I think, and I can't give you the exact figure, but it was somewhere around a thousand murders were directly linked to the firearms that he supplied to gangs on the basis of ballistics evidence. And, um, there was a conversation amongst certain victims, families of a class action. Um, I haven't seen anything. Thing since since that conversation has happened, I know there was a massive outcry on certainly on social media a few months ago when he was you know information became you know came to light that he'd been released on you know on parole. So we, yeah, it's that that's that's the story at the moment. He he didn't serve much time. He says, but he served a few years in prison. Thank you. 
um, and you had a you know a thousand cases, and I think you know kind of more than a hundred kids were killed with the guns that he supplied to gangs. So it's a, a huge travesty. Travesty. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Just uh, Meyer and Sutherland, if you can just put your hands down, so we can just have a uh, make sure that we've got right. I see David, your hands up again. You're welcome to ask a question since we have time. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Feel free to skip over me. I had to get other questions as well. Um, I, I know a couple of people in the, the, the restaurant world in Cape Town, and my, I'm clearly just a very naive guy because I was horrified to hear the stories about protection rackets and organised crime. And so that, that, that's that's still pretty horrific to, to my mind. Is that specific to Cape Town compared to national level? Is that a significant driver, or is that mostly a, a crime of limited violence? Does that contribute to the story at all? Well, it's part of the story. Um, what we know from reports, and it, it is pretty patchy information at the moment, but we know that the individuals who are behind the extortion rackets or protection rackets or um, you know security arrangements, whatever term one wants to, to use, are key figures in the criminal underworld and are central in many of the most violent gangs in Cape Town, but also in Gauteng. So they operate, there's a lot of business for this type of work within Gauteng. There's a lot more than there is in Cape Town, but it is Cape Town and, and in Gauteng where they operate. Um, and they, the individuals involved have been linked to many of the murders that have been taking place. So the kind of violence is happening in communities and it's happening between in high crime areas between particular individuals, but those involved in extortion rackets have been involved in these particular firearms and how they've been distributed. So for example, um, one particular individual kind of key, you know, figure in the criminal underworld, we've all heard of Nafiz Modak, has been linked to individuals who set up uh, private security companies to secure firearms in order for them to use. And those firearms haven't just been used for private security, they've been used in the commissions of, of other violent crimes. So these, these are connected. Um, it's about the violence is largely about control of the drug trade. Um, and the violence in terms of the restaurant business, it's come to light more in the restaurant business because what COVID and lockdown has done is it's closed down the bars and the nightclubs, which were the the mechanisms in which drugs could be distributed. Um, and so you were securing money through those entities, but they've, you know, many, many of them have had to close. So the focus has then moved to restaurants and extorting money out of restaurants. So yeah, so the individuals involved in that are connected to the violence and the violent gang wars that are happening within Cape Town. Any other questions or comments? Just in a thank you from me. Uh, that was really interesting, pretty, pretty, pretty sombering stuff. I really appreciate that and thanks for, for bearing with all my questions. Thanks, Kai. That's a pleasure. And just tomorrow, I mean, I, I need you to start with where the problems are and then we look at the solutions. And, I, and what I'm really going to be focusing on is that even though Cape Town has this problem, it has some very innovative things that are happening within the city. So there's, you know, there is a lot of political will, certainly in the city and in the Western Cape government, to try and do something about this. Um, and, you know, ideas of, of how to come at this using evidence and science as a means to address it. But there are many complicating political factors at play. So I'll be talking about that. But certainly tomorrow's lecture will be looking at what can be done about this realistically and what is currently happening um, and how do we build on that. So that will be the focus of tomorrow's lecture. So a certainly more positive, uh, more positive approach, less sobering, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you, Guy. Um, if there are no more questions or uh, contributions, um, we'll see you tomorrow. And thanks to the participants for joining us in this course. Thank you. All right. Thank so we'll you, everyone. You. Thank you for making the time to be here, and I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.